common sense with Junior Doan, sharing the wisdom and insight of those who have been there and done that. Hello everyone, welcome back to Uncommon Sense. A chance to talk with real people about real life to find out how to handle the lows and enjoy the highs. With me today is a visitor from Ann Arbor, Dr. James Baker, who is head of the Allergy um, Division of the University of Michigan and also director of the Biologic Nanotechnology Institute and chairman of the board of Nanobiology. Bio Bio what, Jim? Nanobio Corporation. Bio, Nanobio Corporation. That's okay. I want to get that properly um, said. There are certain things I admire about Jim that I want you to know. Jim is very quick, and he's very quick to analyze things well and make a decision. But he has the other thing that's really important when you make a decision, and that's to see it through quickly and thoroughly. Now, Jim, all of us in our lives have had high points and low points. <laughs> A few, yes. A few. <laughs> what do you say to yourself when something untoward happens, something that you didn't expect that throws you off the back? You know, I, I was probably fortunate because early in life I had a number of episodes like that. Uh, being in the Vietnam era, I won the draft lottery, and it, it was certainly not something I had hoped for. Uh, I, I wound up with three, which meant that uh, I had to do something, and, and I wound up joining them reserves during college and you know it it was the type of thing that really was life-changing because mm. you you had to make a commitment and it was certainly not anything anyone in the early 70s wanted to be involved with uh, but you know it taught me that everything that happens you know is an opportunity mm. and that really made a difference uh, you know I wouldn't be doing anything of what I'm currently involved with if it weren't for that chance happening and, and taking what sort of life gives you and moving with it. Why is it so that you wouldn't be doing what you're doing now? Well, actually, it's interesting. You know, I, I would have probably have been a physician, but because I went in in the military and I owed them time, they gave me the opportunity to develop as a research physician you know, and an mm. academic. And, and I doubt that I would have had that chance if it weren't for the fact that I owned the Army 10 years of my life at that point and, and you know, had the time to really develop without, uh, you know, without the thought of going out and trying to make money. <laughs> right. I hear the academic world is very competitive and often very difficult. You have a lot of bright people in close quarters vying for overlapping or perhaps the same thing. How do you handle difficult people that you meet now and again, perhaps? Well, I never <laughs> meet anyone that's difficult. Um, you know, I think academia, like every uh, you know, large organization, has issues. And, and I think people learn to deal with them in different ways. I sort of pride myself on just taking people as they present themselves, you know, and in allowing them to define themselves for me rather than me defining them. Mm -hmm. And I think if you, if you allow people to sort of live up to expectations that are positive, they tend to do it. You know, mm -hmm. if you try and enforce your own expectations on people, they tend, it tends not to work very well. And especially when you're dealing with intelligent people, if you can get them to the point where they understand that whatever is going on is a benefit to everyone, especially them, you mm -hmm. tend to get a much better result. Um, you know, the, the old Henry Kissinger line, academia, academic fights are so intense because the stakes are so low. Oh, right. <laughs> you know, I, I think, you know, that's sort of human nature, you know. I, I don't know if it relates to when we evolved out of the primal camps, but people tend to try and protect their turf, whatever they're doing. And, and what you need to do is convince them that you know, what you're interacting with enhances their environment rather than takes away from it. Mm -hmm. Did your parents have anything to say on how to get along with people? Um, 
I think my father said, just shut up and <laughs> yeah, listen. Um, but, but my mother, you know, I, basically my mother uh, was an immigrant. Mm. And her parents um, even had difficulty speaking English, as I remember growing up, my grandparents. And, you know, one of the things that she learned and believed in is never, never really turn anybody down. You know, mm -hmm. if people come to you with things and they're sincere, you know, don't dismiss it. If you can't do it, see how you can work with them to make something happen. But, you know, if people are coming to you, it's because there's a reason and usually there's some benefit involved in it. And, and if only the benefit of finding out about different people and how they do things. Now, that's interesting because there's such a difference. Well, everyone handles things differently. I, I mean, we've all evolved in our own little sphere uh -huh. with our own little gene pool. And, and because of it, we all handle things differently. And, and seeing how other people handle issues, seeing how other people approach problems. One of the neat things about what I do now is that we have a very multidisciplinary institute at right. the university. So I work with applied physicists, material science folks, optics science, uh, and, and they're things that I really uh, barely can interact on, but, right. but learning how people in totally different fields approach problems and how they address them has been a tremendous help for me and certainly has been one of the driving forces behind the research that we've done. Which is very important research. Yes. Being in the health field, um, if you have a health problem, <laughs> how do you take it? I mean, because you must have all the data either in your head or available, and yet you're going through the experience, or someone close to you is going through the yeah, experience. Yeah, I mean, uh, being a physician, if I have a health problem, I totally ignore it. Yeah, right, <laughs> it's right. standard. Um, you know, it, it's it's harder when it's people close to you and your family. I think that's a very difficult thing to deal with. And, and one of the things that I try and do as a physician, if, if another physician comes to me with a family member who, who is ill or has some problem, you know, you, you try and address it very rapidly because just the mental angst of mm -hmm. knowing all the possible horrible things that could happen really is a difficult thing to deal with. And if you can basically diffuse that rapidly, you really accomplish something. But there's a saying among doctors that, um, you know, if, if another doctor calls you up about their child, no matter how trivial it is, get the kid in immediately, because usually they've ignored it to the point the last where moment. it's a disaster. But, uh, you know, I, I think doctors tend to be that way. They tend to try and minimize things, you know, in a way because it reinforces uh, how they view the world. I mean, you could not take care of people and see everything they go through and emote with them entirely. It would destroy you. Mm -hmm. And so you have to separate yourself. And, and the first instinct is to sort of, you know, step aside from your own problems. And, and it's often harder to get doctors to live up to the emotional ramifications of having a sick child or a sick spouse or an illness themselves than it is people who aren't in the health field. Hmm. Do you think it's changed you being a physician? You talked about being sort of falling into the research academic area. I think, I think the thing that changes you most as a physician is seeing really the ram randomness of health and mm -hmm. illness. Uh, you know, we all like to think we have some special imprimatur from God that <laughs> means that we're immortal and, and immutable and everybody else just has these problems. But, you know, you see people who are totally healthy who just have a stroke and drop dead. You see folks who, you know, I, I mean, one story, I had a, a patient in clinic uh, who came in for follow-up of a, a fairly significant health problem that had beat it. And two days later, I saw them dead in the emergency room because they got hit by a car. You know, mm. I mean, uh, you know, life is really a very uh, tenuous thing. and. I think you learn to cherish it a lot more. You know, both, you know, the the, the mere protection of life in people mm. and the appreciation of, you know, the wonders of life.
both in your own family and, and within society as a whole. What, how do you personally cherish? I mean, you're so busy, but I mean, yeah, what we do you all tell run yourself? around like we're nuts these days. Right. I mean, that's just the way life is. And, and right. But you know, you need to every day, you know, reserve some time to appreciate things and, and to think about you know, where you're at in the large realm where your family is at. I have an eight-year-old. Right. And, and she's a very precocious eight-year-old and, and for some reason developed the capability to tell you exactly what's on her mind at any point in time from a very early age. Not that that was inherited. But I know, at all. At all. But, <laughs> from um, either side. <laughs> no, from either side. But, uh, you know, I mean, seeing her grow and making sure that I'm there for her while she's growing and appreciating the very small things that really make her life unique uh, and, and make my life with her unique and my life with my wife unique are things that you never can lose because that's, you know, when you lose touch with that, you, you've got nothing. No matter how much money you make, no matter what award you win, you know, when you lose a sense of yourself and a sense of the specialness of the people around you, you know, nothing matters. That's, um, that's the uh, testamentary to relationships, right? Really to love, right? Yes. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, being, being capable of loving is a very difficult thing. I don't think any of us are born with it. I mean, we have sort of a biologic capability mm. to respond, right. you know, and certainly respond well enough to keep our mothers from, you know, tossing us out right. of the window. But um, to truly love people, you know, in a way that's selfless and not expect anything in return and just appreciate the ability to have someone that you care about, I think is an acquired, uh, uh, capability and, and it, it maybe I, I, I once told someone that the gardening gene, the golf gene, and the love gene don't come on until you're after 30. Right. <laughs> you know, they don't seem to function oh. the same way. You know, they may have short fits and spurts, but they don't come on sort of all the time. And, and uh, yeah, maybe it's a sense of your own mortality that does that. Mm. Yeah. How does one work on learning to love? What, what, what does one do? What did you do or think about? Well, I, I, I'm i not sure that, that I initiated this. I think sometimes, you know, circumstances force it on you. Mm -hmm. I mean, my wife was ill a few years back, and, mm -hmm. and you know, I think that, that gives you an appreciation of the, you know, the fact that your own situation doesn't last forever, and you better appreciate it. You know, same thing with my daughter. You know, you don't you have to remember that, that just because everything is perfect right now, you know, it, you don't control your own universe. No one does. Uh, and I if you don't appreciate it while it's there, you know, you'll certainly have nothing when it's gone. Right. My grandmother used to say life is like the weather. And I've noticed in my own life there are wonderful periods and everything looks just smooth and just terrific and it's going along. And then it shifts. And yes. sometimes, sometimes you have to hold on tight because the rapids are tough. You know? Well, it's always easy to appreciate the sunny days if you right. want to carry the weather analogy further. It, right. It's learning to enjoy the rain yeah. know, and be able to really take from it the strength that you need to move forward. Uh, I mean, we've all had situations where we put our faith in people and, and I try and do that. I try and, and believe people for what they are. And, and on occasion, you know, somebody will disappoint you. And to not be angry about that, but, you know, to take the realization that the most important thing was that you trusted the person in the first place and that, you know, for whatever period of time there was something positive from it. And although it didn't work, you know, you can feel good for having trusted them and worked with them, just move on. I think those are things that people really have to learn. And, um, you know, I, I, think, I think taking people and taking, uh, you know, situations for what they are and moving on in a positive way and not dwelling on the negatives 
is really what allows us to grow. So many people do dwell on the negative. Uh, how do you just sort of cut yourself off from either the anger or the disappointment or the frustration of the experience? It, it's actually easy to dwell on negatives. I mean, you know, yeah. it's almost easier to just sit there and blame things and think about what could have happened, you know. If, if but it's, it's totally unproductive. <laughs> right. You'll never get anything out right. of it. And, and I think you almost have to discipline yourself to say, fine, you know, I've spent 48 hours whining about this. What can I do to either fix it or what can I do to move forward? And, you know, it, as a supervisor, someone that leads a company or leads an institute, the most important thing you in, in part to people is attitude. Hmm. You know, that, that no matter what happens, if you are undeterred, you know, if you will not be set back by things and dwell on them, if you'll keep your eye on your goal, you'll achieve it. And, uh, you know, time and time again, it's amazing the most talented and creative people cannot get beyond sort of the boxes they put themselves into, and they, they don't reach their potential. And, and that's really, if you're a good supervisor or a good leader, you can help evolve them through that and get them refocused on their goal and allow them to use their own gifts to achieve it. What, what, how would you do that? Or how would you advise someone to do that? Whether it was personal to them, they had to get out of the box, or they were trying to help someone else get out of their constrained you know, it, it's, there's probably no one way to do it. I mean, and, and you have right. to individualize for each person to right. some degree. You know, I've done it by screaming and stomping right. around right. to some degree, you know. Right. But I've also done it, you, you wind up with intelligent people almost having to debate them, you know, and, and go in and say, you know, what are the issues? What's holding you back? And go in and just show them each time why what they believe is a block really isn't and what mm. their options are. And, and it's amazing. I think people tend to get so frustrated they lose perspective. I think mm -hmm. we all do at times. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and just offering them a way around you know, whatever's really holding them up is, is what allows them to get moving again. You know, it's, it's often really simple. You can just go in and say, well, why don't you try this? You talk about being angry sometimes is a way of being, let's say, <laughs> or blowing up, or however you want to say it. But what role does, uh, or how do you deal with your emotions when you want to be analytical and develop those options? You know, it, the toughest thing is, you know, to suppress, you know, your act out emotions because I think most of us, at least initially in life, uh, are are run by those. Um, I think what you try and do is is not number one. Don't impart your own prejudices mm. on the process. You know, weigh everything equally, and, and don't be uh, don't don't be prejudicial, and especially don't impart that on a group that you're working mm -hmm. with. Yeah, you know, I mean it's amazing that that most of the time. You know, when someone is facilitating or leading a group, they come to the conclusion that that person wants. Right. <laughs> and that's, that's often not the best <laughs> outcome. Could, right. Um, so you really have to take a step back personally and, mm -hmm. and withdraw your personal interest from it and, and relook at things. Often, often, you know, argue against your first judgment. You know, just go in and say, well, I think this is the case, but, you know, if that isn't right, what are the implications and how could I be wrong in that? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and often I challenge people. I ask them a question and say, I think this. You know, how am I wrong? Tell me mm. how I'm wrong. And, Wonderful you know, question. if you do it in a way that, that you know, encourages mm -hmm. them and, and shows that you're open to their input, you know, they'll often tell you things you won't see otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, there's... <laughs> Are you going to ask me a scary question? I would never ask you a scary oh, question, okay. ever, ever, Jim. You're too kind. <laughs> well, uh, yes, I am, actually. Yes. But um, um, I was thinking sometimes our children teach us something. What, did your daughter teach you patience? What did your daughter teach I you? 
Yes. Um, yeah, I, I mean, my daughter actually is wonderful. This is everyone's yeah. child. But I mean, she's really, you know, she's the type of child that you don't need a lot of patience with. She's very yeah. calm. Yeah, you know, and she just does her own thing, and, and you know, if she's unhappy with something, she'll say, I'm unhappy with this, but I know you want me to do it, so I'll do it for a while more, but you better come up with a new plan. For good soon. reason. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think what she's told me, taught me as much as anything is, is that, um, you know, very early on, children are their own people. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, she has her own taste. And certainly it's nothing that either my wife or I would have pressed her in or opened her to. She has things that she wants to do that are very different than maybe the aspirations I might have tried to imprint on her. And, uh, you know, I, I think I try and give general direction, but I can't dictate to her, you know, outside of bedtime and, and certain rules, you know, what she's going to do with her life. And I think what she taught me more than anything is that you want to make her feel secure enough in what she's doing that she'll be able to move forward with it. It's interesting to me because the way you approach her is the way you approach the people in your institute. And I, I'm asking myself, you know, we, I always feel I learn from everybody all right. the time. Right. You know, I'm like a, um, I don't know if I'm an experienced sponge or a knowledge sponge, but I'm constantly surprised when people say to me, they really make my life bigger. You know, get me to think of something differently or different right. in a different way. And it has nothing to do with age. It almost has nothing to do with education. You know, it's just something comes along, and there it is, and you can put it in. But when I hear you talk about the staff of the Institute or, you know, people, and I hear, I hear the same uh, take people for what they are, right? Work with who they are, right? That's nice. And, and, and hope that everyone reaches their own potential and feels right. accomplished. You know, groups work best when everybody in the group feels like they're getting something positive about the interaction and it's helping them move forward. Uh, you know, if you're imposing your own will on the group for your own satisfaction, you know, it'll never work. Does it take different skills to run an institute versus a private company? Uh, usually, yes. I mean, yeah, like there are there are remarkable parallels. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, you have to have enough financial support to keep the doors open. You have right. to have well-defined goals. Um, I in a way, the company is much easier because the endpoint is a marketable product. Mm -hmm. That gives you, you know, positive revenue. Mm -hmm. Will pay back your investors, and and you know, there's a commonality there mm -hmm. that money provides. You know, I mean, it's it's an easy focus, and and in a way, it's easier to get people on the same page because they realize, especially if you've incentivized them correctly, right. that they're all going to benefit from it financially. Um, the institute is more ephemeral. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people belong to institutes and, and research organizations, not because it's the best financial option for right. them most of the time, but because there's a greater good and an right. interest that they can accomplish in it. And I often find that, that um, you de what, what motivates people in institutions is much more varied than what motivates them in companies. You know, the, the positive benefits they get out of it. Some people enjoy the interaction with other folks, other scientists. Some people enjoy the fact that they're f they can grow as an individual and, and benefit from, mm. um, you know, the, the communal atmosphere. Some folks like the security. You know, I mean, in these types of institutions, there tends to be more security than there is in a startup company, for example. Um, but you have to individualize much more. It's not like you can give stock options for feeling good or stock options for, you know. I, I would think that, I would think partly the intellectual puzzle would drive people, just the, the quest to know, to seek further understanding, you know, to be at one with the universe. But anyway, I want to thank Jim for being with us today. We've learned an awful lot from Jim. Uh, Firstly, we are not in control of our lives, that destiny is often 
happens to us, like he, he was saying, his army experience took him in a totally different direction because of his obligation for medical, um, medical payback time. Took him from being a physician to being a research um, person at the university and an entrepreneur. And we also learn from him that he accepts people the way they are and tries to let them come to him and to work with them in the ways they understand, including his daughter, but, but mostly with people. They are different, and they respond differently to things that love as gardening, but love sometimes you have to teach yourself. Maybe that comes a little bit later in life. Maybe it comes by generosity of time, generosity of your presence with that person, that life, uh, learning from some illness with his wife uh, in past years, point out that we have this moment, but we don't know about the next moment. This is his uh, mention of a person that did recover from their disease, but then showed up in the emergency two days later dead of an accident. So I would say that he has uh, taught us to um, keep ourselves open, to really try and learn from the experience. That while the sunny days, as he says, is good, the dark days, the rainy days is where we learn so be brave, everybody, when you hit your dark days. And to see that while you have the immediate mo emotional reaction of, of fear, tears, anger, whatever, try and to the side and see what your options are and look at the, the pros and cons, if you will. And also use that wonderful question he taught us, which is, here is my opinion. Tell me where I am wrong. It invites the other person to comment, and you can learn yourself. So thank you when you see him around Ann Arbor. <laughs> thank you for tuning in. And remember, kindness counts. Live kindness today with someone. Thank you. Thank you so much. See you next time. To share your comments and suggestions, contact Junior. The email address is juniordone at AOL.